networks. Networks, mathematically, as we will see, a network is a matrix. But uh, from a physics, network is a way of representing a given system. In physics, you have two kinds of systems. Huh? The so-called continuous systems, for which you attain the description in terms of uh, uh, differential equations, partial differential equations, think about fluids, the atmosphere, things about solids, things about these things. And of course, there is a lot of physics about uh, continuous systems. And then there are, instead, distributed systems. Distributed systems are systems which are composed by a distributed amount of unitary components. So, systems such that uh, I can split them uh, in uh, a given amount, usually a lot, of, uh, of components which I individuate as nodes okay? and uh, these components are interacting among them which I usually uh, consider them as link so you have a system, a big huge system and uh, the main idea is that the global behavior of the system, the functioning of the system uh, can be understood if you describe properly the interactions between the components and can be understood as a sort of collective emergent phenomena, collective emergent state uh, due to the interactions of, of these elements. So if you want for, from a phys physical point of view, uh, a network is uh, a representation, is a framework in which you study uh, some system, some big, huge system. And today I would like to start uh, discussing with you uh, the tools through which we usually characterize uh, the structural properties of this uh, elements, these systems, whereas tomorrow I will uh, introduce uh, instead dynamics and uh, I will try to characterize and discuss with you what happens when you have uh, the elements of this system being dynamical systems and uh, providing you uh, a function like what happens for example in the brain. The brain is a huge big network of neurons which are dynamical systems. And the way the brain is functioning is, is through the organization, collective organization of these elements. So today, therefore, we focus on structure and we try to understand if we can give some information on systems like this. This is the actor collabor collaboration network. Is uh, you take all the movie database, uh, all the movies that have been produced in the story of the cinema, and each actor is uh, one node. So this is one actor, this is another actor, this is another actor, and two actors are connected if they perform together in the same movie. So if there is a movie in which both of them are performing, there is a link between them. Uh, so, you see, you get this very, very strange and very, very complicated structure and you want to understand if uh, making this representation as a structure and uh, gives you some mathematical tool to describe uh, somehow the interesting points about, uh, about this system. So, uh, I told you a network uh, is defined as uh, as a collection of nodes. So usually uh, the number of nodes is denoted by n. 
and uh, a collection of interactions, of pairwise interactions, which are called links. And uh, the number of links is usually indicated by L, capital L. So, in the first uh, description, a network is uh, an N times N matrix. Which is called a diacency matrix A, and which is done this way is a, a quadratic matrix n times n, in which the elements in the diagonal are zero, and the elements out of the diagonal are a i j equal to one. If there is a, a link that starts from node i and ends up in node j and zero if there is no link. Eh? So you immediately see that uh, you can have uh, a first uh, uh, classification of networks. For example, networks, these are binary networks, so if there is a link or there are not a link, so it's called unweighted networks, so links are all equal to 1 in strength as opposed to weighted networks in which uh, A, I, J can have a value different than 1, it can be a real number and uh, for example this situation is described in the fact that these two actors performing in more than one movie. Yeah, so they, for example, played together in many movies, so their link is very, very deep. Yeah? Imagine this is a, a very similar to another network, uh, weighted network that you can construct from social, from social data, which is the network of musical taste. So people like to publish, for example, their playlist. They like this, 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 this song. So you can imagine that the entire music of the world can be mapped in a big, huge network in which each note is a song, whatever song, from Mozart to modern time. And a link exists between two songs if there is a taste in the world that accumulate the two songs. So if there is a playlist that says that contains the two songs. So it's evident if you take songs like Yesterday and My Way, there's a lot of people that like these songs, so you have a very, very big, huge link between them. And if you take two very specific songs, uh, for example, of heavy metal, it's uh, more difficult that you have uh, such uh, a, a, a popular uh, popular pairing, so you have uh, weighted networks. Moreover, networks can be undirected if AIJ is equal to AJR. So it means that uh, uh, the see, adiacent symmetries in this case uh, is symmetric because all elements A, I, J are equal to A, J, I. So the, the interaction between node I and node J is the same as that from node J to node I. Whereas they are called directed networks, networks if instead this uh, uh, condition does not hold. So in directed network, what you have, you have, uh, uh, for example, imagine uh, networks. Uh, uh, some of you stayed. I, I, I remember some few faces in the, in the seminar. I mentioned network from food webs. In food webs, you have directed interaction because you have prey predator interaction. So a wolf uh, is eating chicken. So uh, uh, wolf and chickens are. Uh, among them, the wolf are nodes of uh, the entire chain, supply, chicken are another node, and there is a direct link between wolves and chickens. Okay? Uh, of course, no, the, the most uh, uh, 
the generic situation, which is also the most difficult to want to treat, is that of mixed networks. Mixed, mixed networks are those uh, in which you have both unidirectional links from one node to another and bidirectional links. And once again, this is, happens usually in food, uh, in ecological networks. Imagine that you have uh, many species, and usually when you have many species, you have two main categories. One are herbivores and the other one are carnivores. So the herbivores, they compete among them for eating the same grass. So, all herbivores are genetically connected between them by bidirectional links. Because uh, I interact with another herbivore and the other herbivore is feeling me because we are competing for the same grass. Whereas, the interactions between carnivores and herbivores are, as I said before, of direct type. So, there is a, a, a direct link. So, the most general case uh, is, uh, again, a adiacent symmetric, uh, which is uh, non-symmetric uh, and uh, contains uh, some uh, group of nodes, some pairs EJ, IJ, where this condition holds, and some other pairs where this condition does not hold, uh, is not uh, uh, holding. Moreover, so this is a description of the network that is, uh, as soon as I have a network, I have a matrix. And uh, uh, together with uh, this matrix, and now for the time being I will assume to be in the simpler situation, that is uh, to have an undirected and unweighted graph. It is uh, now my adjacent matrix is made of zeros and ones. Eh? And, uh, when, and zeros are the elements of the diagonal, and ones are the elements outside of the diagonal. I can, uh, for some process, as we will see tomorrow, it is interesting to uh, associate to this adjacency matrix another matrix, which is called the Laplacian matrix. And the Laplacian matrix is nothing but the adjacent symmetrics in which, uh, instead of zeros in the diagonal elements, you report the degree of each node. Now, I told you that, for example, this line of the adjacent symmetries contains uh, ones in the positions corresponding to the level of the nodes which are connected to node 1. And this the same for node 2, node 3. So I can define, what I can write here, I can define a uh, degree of a, of a node, the number of connection this given node is having with the rest of the network. And you see immediately that for unweighted and uh, undirected graph, the degree k of node i is nothing but the sum over j of the elements of the row i of the adjacent symmetric. Okay? Because here I have a one, all the times I have a connection. So the number of connection is the number of ones I have received in this row. So, in order to uh, obtain uh, the Laplacian matrix, uh, what uh, I will have to do is uh, I repeat the adjacency matrix in all its uh, known diagonal part. So, these are exactly the same. And instead of putting zero in the Diagonal elements, I put here minus a1, here I put minus a2, here I put minus a3, and here I put minus an.
So one property, and it's very important to the Laplace La Almeida matrix that we will use extensively tomorrow, is that the Laplace La matrix is, is a zero row sum. That is, if I make the sum on the each row of the Laplace matrix, I obtain zero for each row because the sum of this element is k1 minus k1 get zero. The sum of all these elements except this is k2 minus k2 I get zero. Okay, and we will see that this has important consequences. For example, in the spectrum of the matrix when you do diagonalization of this matrix and so on. So we have defined what uh, a degree of a node is, and let me, as a function of the degree, tell you something else. So degree of the node is, of course, the number of terminations that they have, but together with the degree, what is important is the connectedness of the network. So, is the network connected or isn't it? And what does it mean connected? It means that I can start from one point in the network and navigate and reach in the structure of the network any other point. So in order to uh, um, do this, I need to define a few things. First of all, I need to define the distance between nodes. Okay? So, if two nodes are connected, I say that their distance is one, because there is one link from one node to the other. If the nodes are not connected, for example, I have this node connected with these two, which are connected to these other two, which are connected to this and this, the idea is how much is the distance from node A to node B. Hmm? And in general, what I have to do is I have to navigate in the network in the way I can start from node A and reach node B within a finite number of steps, which will be my distance. Hmm? So, the idea in this uh, example is that uh, I go from A to this node A prime, from A prime to A second, from A second to A third, and from A third to B. So I can reach B in one, two, three, four steps. Okay? <coughs> in fact, not always I can do this. If the network is not connected, I may have pairs of nodes such that there is no connection. Imagine, for example, the network is formed by two groups of nodes. It's like this. So, this forms a component of the network, and this forms another component of the network. So, Component of the network is the maximal number of nodes such that taking any pair of them, it exists always a path from one to the other. So I will call net the network connected if there is a path from any node to any other node. So in con connected networks, I therefore form a unique component which is called the giant big component of the network. In other cases, I can have disconnected networks in which I represent them as one network, but in fact there are two different networks, two different components, eh? because I can never uh, uh, travel from one node of one component to another node of the other component. There is no path. So the network connectedness is the property of a network of having at least one path from any node to any other node. In general, however, all 
also for connected networks, so we turn to here, the path can be uh, different. So if, uh, for example, I want uh, to get from this node, let's call this node uh, D, to this other node A3, I can go this way, but I can also go this other way. So, in general, for connected networks, you have a multiplicity of paths which leads you from one to the next. And this is very important, for example, for biological networks, which has to be resistant to some damage, to have this uh, extra path, because if I get the damage on a path, I have another path that I can use. I can define the shortest path as the path that corresponds to the minimum distance between two nodes. So you see immediately that if I use this path, let's say path number one, I need to make one, two, three steps from reaching, for reaching A triple, uh, A triple from the if I do the other path, I need to make one, two, three, four, five steps for doing the same. So normally, eh, the persons like to do the shortest path, so they will select this one. So given two nodes in a connected network, I define distance between these two nodes, the length in terms of steps, of the shortest path connecting them. Okay? In this case, the distance between D and A triple is 3. Because there is at least one path in the network eh, which allows me in three steps to get from node D to node A triple. Notice that the shortest path itself can be degenerate. I can have, for example, another node here, let's call it B prime, another node here B second, and I can have this structure connected. In this case, the distance between A, D, and A triple is still 3, but this distance corresponds to two different shortest paths. Okay? So, in principle, in the network you can have redundancy of short path, and this is also an important uh, property which uh, we will uh, uh, discuss uh, very soon. Okay, so one first characterization of networks is, uh, can be done in terms of their reachability. So, how can I reach in a structure like this, one node starting from any other node. And this is a very, very good problem because... Uh, ah, sorry, first, first of all, take note, please, of this uh, uh, big monography. This is more than 100 page because uh, a lot of what I'm going to say today and tomorrow you can find uh, there so if you want to have a sort of textbook that you can consult on, uh, on, this, uh, on these lectures. <coughs> so, uh, what about uh, uh, distances? This is a very famous experiment that was done by Milgram in the 1967. Very old experiment. He wanted to quantify the reachability of person in a social network. So basically, in social network, you have that the nodes are the individuals and the links are some kind of social relationships. And the experiment we conducted was the same, the following. We are speaking of 1967. There was no social networks, there was no internet, there was only letters. So it took 500 people from Nebraska which is a small state of the United States, 
and gave this uh, 500 people 500 targets in another state of the United States, which were Oklahoma. So, this person did not know each other. The experiment was, I give you a target, that is, you have to reach this person. You have to reach Mr. Andre who is living in uh, Novosibirsk in Siberia. Okay? Novosibirsk in Siberia, no. I don't know. It is insane. So you have to, to reach this person. You, of course, don't know this person. But then, what Milgram uh, was asking is, you please write a letter to a person that you know instead, uh, which is part of your friends, of your knowledge, which you think may be closer to the person you have to reach. For example, you may know somebody, some physicist of Novosibirsk, or the priest, the Pope of Novosibirsk. So you write to him, and you ask him to do the same, to write the next person that he think uh, he can be closer to this person. And each copy of the letter, you have to send a copy, of course, to Milgram, okay? So, Starting from the 500, these 500 write to some people, these some people write to some other people, and so on and so forth, up to, eventually, you reach somebody who knows exactly the person who is familiar with this person that has to reach. So the last letter is indeed sent to this person. So <clears throat> he could complete this 500 track, and he measured how many steps, in average, a letter had to do from one person, eh, one original person, to the destination person. And he found a very, very nice result, which is that, surprisingly, this is a very little number of steps. It's six. And he wrote this book, The Six Degrees of Separation, that is that he claimed that social networks are organized such that, starting from any node, you can reach any other node, any other person in the world, by only six steps. This was done in 1967, and it was repeated by May. There was a very huge program of Yale University in the uh, year 2001 uh, in which they basically you could uh, be volunteer for this program mm -hmm. and if you are volunteer you were given another volunteer who accepted to be uh, the end point of uh, a mail chain. Yeah, okay? So, uh, with this system, they collected millions, not 500, millions and millions of mail exchanges because the game was the same. You had to write a mail to a person that you know eh, in your mailbox that you think it was sufficiently close to your target. I was a volunteer, I was given an Indian person, and I had to reach this Indian person. So I immediately wrote to my colleague in the same city. Because yeah. and say, look, do you know this person? Yes, no. If no, can you please write to somebody who, who knows a male, who knows this person, you think he knows this person, and maybe from the city you go to the small quarter, from the small quarter you go to the street, and then you eventually get this. So, in the 2001 project of Yale, they completed several millions of such paths. So the statistics were really good. And surprisingly enough, the statistics gave 5.8. So it means that really our social network, which you imagine is done by 7.5 billion people, is organized in a way that uh, uh, it's easy to navigate into the network. And this easiness of navigation 
is the basis, for example, of many, many algorithms that were developed that typical people who navigate the network is Google. Google needs to navigate the network to give you uh, a ranking of the web pages when you make uh, a given search or, you know, recommendation network. So this property is uh, known as the small word property. Eh? And the small word property that in a, in a mathematical sense uh, is a little bit uh, more complicated and it seems it, it tells you this that in real world network once you calculate the shortest distance between any node to any other node you can write uh, the distance matrix uh, the matrix again n times n such that the element in the diagonal is zero because the distance from a node to itself is zero and bij is the value of the shortest path from node i to node j correct? now the shortest path L of the network is defined as the number, of course, in a, in a direct, in an undirected network, the shortest path from I to J is equal to the shortest path from J to I, because all the links are bidirectional. So it's uh, this uh, shortest path can be defined like two divided n n minus 1, the sum for j different i of the ij. Okay, this article is called the shortest path of the network or the average shortest path. And this is the value that milligram said to be 6 in the case of a social network. You can define another quantity from this uh, uh, matrix, which is the diameter of a network, which is the maximum over E different J of the IJ. So the, the diameter tells you the largest difference distance between two nodes. And the shortest path gives you the average of the distances between the nodes. Okay, so a network is said to be small world when it has the following properties: that the shortest path scales as a logarithm of the number of nodes. Hmm? This is uh, important because look, for example, if I have uh, a network which is a ring, by the way, given n nodes Hmm? The number of links is larger or equal than what? Which is the configuration for which you have the minimal number of links between n nodes. Yes, yes, a connected network. Of course, L, if, if you have a disconnected network, L can be zero. But if you have a connected network, when N is uh, the number of nodes, L is larger or equal to N minus 1, okay, this is uh, the situation, 
n is smaller or equal than n times n minus 1 divided by 2, which is when all two, the nodes are connected to all. There is a connection between all nodes and all other nodes. Now, you see that if I take uh, a node to all connected network, the shortest path is always one. Because if I start in a, in a, in a, in a node, I can reach all the other nodes with one step. Okay? If I have this other condition, instead, the distance between two nodes is, in average, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, n over 2. Scales like n over 2. Correct? Because I have to make all the, the step along. So, this means that in this case, I do not have scaling. Because if I double the size of my network, still the distance between two nodes is one and two nodes. In this case, I have a scaling which is linear in the number of nodes. If I now double the nodes, eh, the number of nodes, the length, the, the, the average length, grows linearly with the number of nodes. So, these small world networks are in between the situation eh? and tells you that our networks, which are not all to all connected, usually in a social network, each one of us has a, a limited number of connections with respect to the entire population, but uh, they have the property of being easily navigable in the sense that the length that you need, the number of steps that you need to do from, for mo moving in average from one to another node is not scaling linearly with the number of nodes, but is scaling logarithmically with the number of nodes. So if I double the number of nodes, of nodes the shortest path does not double, but increases very slowly. Okay? So this is uh, an important uh, uh, characteristic of, for example, social network in general, as you will see many other networks. And then people started to study then uh, uh, big networks, uh, big scale networks. This is, for example, the backbone of internet as it was in 2011 in the northeast of the United States. Uh, and one wants to study this giant network and get some information about the structure of these giant networks. So, we introduced already the, the degree of a node, and therefore, one thing that I can easily calculate, I calculate the degree for each one of the nodes, and I can calculate what is the degree distribution, pk. pk is uh, the, the probability that when I take at random one node in the network, I fall in a node with degree k. And in order to calculate pk, what usually I do in a real network is I take prk and I count the number of nodes which, which, have, which have that k, so which have k connection with the rest of the network. And so these are the nodes with one connection, two, three, four, five, six, and I have a given curve. Okay? Uh, let me advance. Uh, one of the first model of networks, uh, I mean, <coughs> in fact, there are many, many other networks, but I would say one very nice theory of networks is that of a random network that was developed by Erdos and Rainey around the 60s. And the idea is uh, I take my nodes, 
You see here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And I assign this node a given probability of forming a connection with another node. Okay? And then I start forming connection at random with this probability up to obtaining the decided number of links. This, for example, is one possible configuration. You see this network is connected. This node has to be one. Uh, with this, no, this, not, this is not connected because these two nodes have to be one and they are connected among them. So uh, they are forming one component, but nevertheless, this node has to be two, one, two. This node has to be three, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So if you co construct networks this way and you uh, calculate the degree distribution, you obtain uh, something very, very nice, which is uh, a, a normal distribution, that is a Poisson distribution, in which you have a very, very clear average degree and very, very little fluctuations. What does it mean? It means that if you pick a random node, you obtain, in most cases, a node having a degree equal to the average degree of your network, plus minus one. It's very difficult to find big differences between the degree of one node and the degree of the other. However, if you go in real world network, you immediately have to understand this is not the case. And I already made this example during the seminar, if you remember. This is transportation networks, two kinds of transportation networks, road transportation networks and air transportation networks. And you see there is a big difference between this case and this case. These are the same cities of the United States as this. Each city is a city and generally each city, each large city has an airport. So you can connect one city to another by road of by airport by flights. When you connect by road, however, you see that no matter the importance of a given city, you have always maximum six, seven streets which departs from the city. Typically one goes north, one goes south, one goes east, one goes west. No? For example, look at here. You have this nice city which is Chattanooga, which is not so important in the United States, which has one, two, three, four, five, six connections. Okay? And then you look at Cleveland, which is much, much more important than Chattanooga, which has only one, two, three, four connections. And then you look at Philadelphia, which has one, two, three, four connections. Uh, Detroit, one, two, three, four, five connections. Uh, Chicago, wow, big city, one, two, three, four, five, six connections. See, whatever you, you, you choose, independently of the importance of the city, you get five, six, four, five, six, four. It means that the distribution of degree that corresponds to this is indeed this one. And these networks are called exponential networks, or if you want, uh, homogeneous networks, in the sense that they are not exactly homogeneous. Homogeneous is a lattice. If I take, for example, a node in two dimensions as vertices of a lattice, this is perfectly homogeneous. Each node has four connections. One to the north, one to the south, one to the east, one to the west. These are not exactly homogeneous in this sense, but are homogeneous in the sense that if I take uh, blindly, I put myself uh, a, a blind stuff and I pick one node at random, I have a tremendous probability of obtaining a node with this value, average degree, and with very, very little fluctuations. Or in any case, fluctuations which decay exponentially to the right and to the left of the mean degree. 
that's very very good because uh, if you know no, in statistical physics uh, when you have a distribution the distribution allows you to calculate all moments of this degree distribution the first moment is the average degree which is the integral of k pk dk for k from k equal k minimum to k maximum hmm? correct then you have the fluctuations which are k square the integral of k square pk dk and in general the n moment is the integral of k to the power n pk dk you understand that if pk has exponential behavior whatever the power is of k the exponential is taking everything so all these uh, uh, integrals are very well defined and you can describe to any level of description you want your very nice uh, distribution mm -hmm. okay the situation is radically different here instead when you consider flight we now see that there is a difference, a big, big, big difference. There are cities, now small cities, which only have one or two connections. Hmm? And there are cities like Chicago now, which has thousands of connections. Eh? And this is something that you have as experience if you again want to move from Novosibirsk to Salt Lake City you usually have to fly Novosibirsk Moscow then Moscow New York the two hubs and then New York Salt Lake City because Salt Lake City only is reachable from New York or from uh, probably two three places and Novosibirsk is only connected to Moscow and probably St. Petersburg so, this means that your network is made by, has a tremendous big difference from apps to isolated nodes. There are nodes with only one, two, three connections, and apps, you know, which contains a thousand and thousand of connections. If you do the degree distribution in this case, you obtain a power law. So you obtain that the logarithm of k, the degree, as a function of the logarithm of the number of nodes having that degree, is a power law. This means that pk goes like k to the minus gamma. And you can measure this gamma in real network. Mm -hmm. And what you have that all real networks, almost all real networks, have gamma smaller than 3, but larger than 2. Okay? Now, what implies this fact? It implies something very, very important that real networks, together with having the property of uh, scale, uh, or sorry, of being a small world, have the property of being scale-free. What does it mean scale-free? It means that, let us calculate the average degree. The average degree is the integral, and now since I am a physicist, I put this uh, from zero to infinity because I want to imagine an ideal case in which the net has infinite nodes of k, k, k that's very good because this is k this is k to the minus gamma so inside here I have k to the one minus gamma correct? 
Now, gamma, look at here, is larger than 2. So this means that 1 minus gamma is smaller than minus 1. Very good. If it is smaller than minus 1, the integral converge. Yeah? And I have a very nice property that these are networks where the average degree is well defined. It's very, very heterogeneous in the sense I can have nodes with houses and nodes, but in the thermodynamic limit, when I increase the size of this network, still, still, the average degrees is well defined. When I instead calculate the fluctuations, I have here k squared pk, so I have here k to 2 minus gamma. And since now gamma is smaller than 3, 2 minus gamma is larger than minus 1. <coughs> and when I integrate something k to a power larger than minus 1, I have infinity. The integral of 1 over x is infinity. It's for x is going to infinity. So, these are networks which are characterized by very large heterogeneity, but much more importantly by the fact that when I increase the size of this network, the fluctuations increase more and more, whereas the average degrees remain the same. You understand the point? So, these networks, for this kind of network, what is really important is not the number of connections each node has, but the fluctuations. And since these networks are really growing, because we are speaking of www, which they have new uh, 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 web pages, or we are speaking of a collaboration network and, and, and in which each day have more papers which are published, or air transportation network, which they have new rules which are published and so on. All these kind of networks have the property of being non-scalable in terms of their fluctuations. And these are tremendous, as we will see tomorrow, it has tremendous consequence when you want to study dynamics of that. Hmm? Because what in dynamics is important is not, you cannot make here the hypothesis, for example, that all the nodes are more or equal the same, I make a, a central limit theorem and I write down the rate equations here, I cannot do this in general. Moreover, the situation is even more complicated because mm -hmm. I now told you everything in terms of degree, degree distribution and property which are related to degree distribution. But I somehow made a small cheap view on it. I said that uh, given a probability distribution, okay, all the properties related to this network can be understood by the different more moments of the distribution. This is formally true formally true, when there is no degree-degree correlations. So, when the degree of a node is a, so to say, uh, a variable which is completely independent. But now I can ask myself, I am a node and I have degree, for example, 3. So I am a node here, and I have three connections. One, two, and three. This is me, and this is my neighbor number one, my neighbor number two, and my neighbor number three. These neighbors, on their own, they have other connections. They have their own degree. So I can ask myself, as my total degree is 3, which 
are the correlation between my degree and the degree of the person of the other nodes to whom I am connected in the network. Hmm? In order to do this, what I can say, I generally study K and N of K. What is K and N of K? I take all the nodes of degree K. For example, I take all the nodes of degree 1, all the nodes of degree 2, all the nodes of degree 3. And I calculate the average degree of the nearest neighbors of the nodes of degree K. I take, for example, in the case of 3, I take this, I look how much is the degree of node 1, how much of the degree of node 2, how much is the degree of node 3. And I divide sum of these 3 degrees divided by 3. And I, furthermore, furthermore, sum of all the nodes that, like me, have degree 3. Correct? And did you understand what I'm doing? I explain again. I take k equal to k0, for example, 3. I take all the nodes with degree 3. For example, I have 100 nodes with degree 3. Each of these nodes have three neighbors. Hmm? I look at the degrees of the neighbors. And I, so this, for example, let me call these three nodes I, J, and K. And this node Z. Hmm? So I get KI plus KJ plus KK divided by 3. This is the average degree of these three. Because this has other connections, this has other connections, and this has other connections. Okay? This is the average degree of the nodes which form the nearest neighborhood of node set. Then I take all the hundred nodes of node 3, and I do the same. And K and N of K is this summed up over all the hundred nodes, which are the same divided by the 100. So this is the average degree of the nearest neighbors of nodes whose degree is K. Okay? When I do this, I have three possibilities, but I have many possibilities. In fact, complicated networks are very strange, but simpler possibilities are K and N does not depend on K. Hmm? So, I make this, but in fact, I don't have this as a collection of points. Okay? When K and N does not depend on K, it means that there is no clear correlations between the node, the degree of a node, and the degree of the nearest neighbors of a node. Okay? So I can make safely the hypothesis that the degree is an independent variable in the network, there are no correlation, and everything is indeed described by the degree, by the degree distribution. Or, I can be monotonically increasing function of K, monotonically increasing function of K. When I have a monotonic increasing function of K, 
I call these assortative networks. And when it's negative, I call them disassortative networks. What does it mean? It means that assortative networks have the tendency that nodes with degree K connect with nodes with degree K. So if I have degree 10, it's very easy and probable that my 10 neighbors have also degree 10. Because the average degree of the nodes with degree K grows with K. The higher is the degree of the class, the higher is... So these are elitary networks. Rich stays with rich people. Poor people stay with poor people. Understand? Can we conclude that this is so dense network? Sorry? The dense, the no, dense no, no, this means network. that you have a rich club inside. You have a club of elitary people. Hmm? So, and K and N is assertivity, yeah? Sorry? It, it's called assertivity. Well, the, it's called the, the, the degree of assertivity is the slope of this okay. uh, curve. Are you still assuming it's connected? I am always assuming it's connected graphs and it's, uh, for the time being, symmetric. So, this means that it's, there is a tendency of nodes with high degree to be connected to nodes with high degree. Here is the opposite. Node with high degree tends to connect with nodes with low degree. Okay? Because it means that the more, the higher is the degree of a node, the lower is the degree of the the average degree of its neighborhood. So if I am an app, I'm connected to a thousand leaves. You understand? Now, I'm telling you something that you can measure these things in real networks, and all real networks have degree-degree correlation. Except one, for which there is still a big debate. Can I tell this thing, this, 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 this things? Why not? It's interesting. It's interesting, but it's, uh, okay, everybody here is more than 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the only network where there is no correlation is the network of sexual relationship between students of the university. So it seems that when you are a student, you don't care. Then when uh, you become uh, a structure in life, you become elitary. So, uh, networks, you know, uh, you become rich, then only with rich. When you become poor, you are still poor, you still only with poor. You understand? So, take advantage of this thing. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. But what is very, very interesting is that you can take, re take real work and you can divide them in three big categories. Technological networks, like for example, air transport network, or like uh, uh, you know, www, or like uh, uh, the network of electricity, you know, distribution network. Then you have social networks, like the ones we discussed up to now, and then you have biological networks, like uh, genetic networks, metabolic networks, the brain. And this tree has nothing to do with each other. So the biological networks have been formed by billions of years of evolution. Men didn't touch anything. Okay? The technological networks are man-made, so they are architectured, are planned, okay, by men. And social network as sometimes want the result of our interaction. So it's a sort of uh, picture 
eh, of how the society likes to organize. Now, all social networks, except the one I told you, is assortative. This means that society organized in an ethical way. Influencer likes to go with other influencers. There is not a single social network, Facebook, can take everything, which is not assertive. On the opposite, technological networks and biological networks are all disassertive. Nobody knows why. Okay? This is a big, huge question. Why? Technological networks and biological networks are all disassertive. Even air transportation? Eh? Even air transportation? Is even, air, no, even air transportation. And the reason is, of course, disassertive networks are very robust because you have this hub which are making uh, us pacemakers okay, of different regions of the network. And since their neighbors are only leaves, each hub determine a big pacemaking of a piece of the network. So the idea, the main idea I think is that this networks have to function in parallel. So they have to have different tasks and, and each task has to be very robust. So you need the big boss that says to the guy, do this, and this boss is the hub. You know? In any case, this is really something important that have to know that all networks in real life have scale-free properties. All networks in real life have degree-degree correlation properties. Social network assertive and technological and biological network disassertive. And all networks in real life have small world properties. This up to now, it has been, up to now means the data set I know, have been confirmed in all cases. And there is a debate whether this is or isn't the way. And uh, before proceeding, I have uh, uh, various issues here. Let me show a few of them. Mm. Uh, this I showed very important. I want to show again. This is uh, the Science Citation Index. You take uh, all the papers. You see, Boccaletti, this is the self citation. This is uh, our physics report, the one. Now the number is not 4,000, it's 10,000, but nevertheless. Uh, so you, only, you have a paper, paper is quoting another paper, and it's quoted by a paper. And you like very much this number. Eh? The number of other papers that are quoting you. Because if you have this number very high, people get crazy and give you a lot of money and the grants are given and you know. And especially the people are now facing the impact factor. They are committed and are giving uh, places the impact factor. Uh, if a candidate published on paper on journals with impact factor, you know. Okay, so if you do this, you calculate the yes, number of, of citations for all to take uh, the entire uh, data set of papers. This is number of citations, number of paper with number of citations larger or equal than x, and you have a very nice tail which is a to the minus n. Which means this is a network where what is important are fluctuations, not the average degree. And the impact factor is the average degree, because it's the number of quotes that you have in a year. Correct? So the impact factor is a good thing for qualifying a journal, but it's horrible as a qualifier of a person who published in that journal. Because you can have a paper published in Nature with zero, and a paper published in a very unknown journal with 10,000 citations. So this means that what all committee are doing today is wrong. 
plainly wrong to judge the importance of uh, a paper by the impact factor of the journal where this paper was published. This is completely wrong, has zero scientific meaning. Okay? Uh, then you have science authorship. This is uh, what we saw at the beginning. This is the actor connectivity. Different actors, they are connected by the movie. Actually, these actors are connected by something else than the movie. <laughs> there was a story. But uh, you see here again, you have a very nice linear tail. Eh? This I told again, speaking about sex, is uh, about the epidemiology, it's a very important uh, you know, uh, experiment that was done in Sweden. They asked how many partners, sexual partners, each male or female had along the last, uh, <coughs> the last uh, 10 years, and you see that there is a very clear, uh, again, K to the minus gamma behavior, which means that if you want to have a model of population to study how a disease is spread, uh, a sexually transmitted disease is spread, you need to have uh, these heterogeneous structures, not homogeneous and, uh, and, uh, and exponential structures. Okay, so this is now a, how, how long I have here? I have to tell you some few other things. What time is it? Sorry, because I want to make a small pause, okay? I want to take a few other things. So I already spoke about you about the distance of the graph, the shortest path, and so on. Now, let me introduce two very important things, and then we go the next hour and a half to discuss this issue, which is modularity and community structures. Okay, so since networks are heterogeneous, the first and still unsolved question that people started to approach is how I can quantify the importance of one node. If I have a homogeneous system, all nodes are equivalent. Because if I take one node at random, this node I will find with more or less the same degree, with more or less the same things. But if I have these heterogeneous networks, then when I pick randomly a node, I can have nodes with very high degree, nodes with very low degree, and the issue is, can I define centrality of a node? That is, how central, how fundamental is a node in a network. This is very important, you, you understand, because I, mean, I want to know which is the most important gene for a cancer, I want to know which is the most important gene. <coughs> I, 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 I want to have a ranking. Eh? <coughs> and I have to tell you that uh, despite this was the very first question that physicists and applied mathematicians asked themselves already many years ago, there is not a unique definition of something. Actually, I like to say that centrality, if you want to have a, a, the proper question is not how central is a node in a network, but is how central is a node in a network for a process. So it depends very much what you want to do. A network can be central or non-central. So the first definition of centrality is quite evident. No? I have heterogeneous networks, so I have uh, nodes with very large degree, nodes with very low degree, so the centrality is the degree. No? More connected I am, the more important I am. So this is the degree centrality, but the degree centrality has a big problem, and the big problem is that the degree centrality leads to very big counterexample. For example, imagine to have uh, this situation of two important nodes 
each one having, so to say, one million connections, but without any connection among them. So there are two hubs, but no flight from these two hubs. And then there is a, a third node here, with only two connections, one to this hub and one to this other hub. Okay? Now, if I assume that centrality of uh, the nodes is the degree, I have to say that the centrality of this node is very little. No, it's only two against the one million. But in fact, if I kill this node, I destroy the connectedness of the network. So this, this node is extremely important because it's the only way for to form a path from any node in these leads to any other node in these leads. If I eliminate this very small node, there is no path from one million nodes here to another million nodes here. Okay? So how can I uh, overcome this issue? And I want to give you the definition because it's rather elegant. Uh, the definition was given by uh, the so-called eigenvector centrality or eigenvalue centrality. So I now consider networks with adjacency matrix A, and I consider this network I repeat uh, connected and symmetric. Then I can make a lot of extension, but for the time being, it's symmetric. If it is symmetric, then this matrix is symmetric, and you know that the properties of a symmetric matrix is that they are always diagonalizable, and moreover, the set of the eigenvalues of this matrix are real number, and the eigenvector of this matrix are forming a basis of a rank. This is the fundamental issue. So now I, I want to define the centrality of these nodes. I want to assign a value of centrality of each one of the nodes. So I want the quantity C sub i, which is larger than zero, which defines the centrality of node i. And now I make this hypothesis that a node is not only central when it, is, it has a lot of connection, but is central also when it connects nodes with a large number of connections, hmm? like the case I made before. So I say that C sub i is proportional, let me call this proportional 1 of the lambda, and you will understand immediately why 1 of the lambda to the sum of the centralities of the node K which are connected to E. So I take N sub I, which is the neighborhood of node I, so this is I, this is node I, neighborhood of node I is this node, this node, and this node, and I say centrality of this node is proportional to this plus this plus this. Okay? Now, evidently, what I can do is I can rewrite this as CI, 1 over lambda, sum over J, AIJ, CJ. Because I take the row I of the adjacency matrix, which is done of many zeros and some one, and the one of the row of uh, the i row of matrix A is exactly the nodes which are connected to node i. Okay? Sorry, could you please say, what is CJ? Could you please say, So I define the centrality of node i as proportional to the sum of the centrality of node k's which are in the neighborhood of node i. 
The north keys are the ones connected to I. So I can rewrite this as one well, lambda, sum j equals one m, a i j times ipsi j. Okay? A i j is the matrix. And I have one of such equations for each i. It's an iterative equation, okay? I have one equation for each i. So now I can define a vector C such that first component of the vector is C1, the centrality of node 1, second component of the vector is C2, centrality of node 2, third component is C3, centrality of node 3, and so on and so forth. Last component is Cn, centrality of node n. And I can rewrite this equation like C1 of lambda A C. Okay? I just wrote all the equations in matricial form. Now, multiply by lambda. You see this equation? This means that the centrality defined this way is nothing but one eigenvector of the adjacency matrix. And the problem is which? Because the adjacency matrix has n eigenvectors. Okay? Hmm? Now, first issue. So, if I define therefore the centrality as the sum of the centralities in the neighborhood, I get the corresponding vector of centrality is an eigenvector of the adjacency. Now, the frobenius perron theorem tells that the eigenvector associated with the maximum eigenvalue of asymmetric matrices, because A is asymmetric matrices, is semi-definite positive. Is all components of this vector are larger or equal than zero. Hmm? So, I have here, this equation gives me lambda 1, lambda n solutions, correct? Which are all real, because my matrix is, uh, is uh, symmetric. And lambda n, if I take Vn, the vector associated with lambda n, is made of all components of Vn are larger or equal to zero. This is the Frobenius the wrong, the wrong view. Now, can other eigenvectors have the same properties? And the answer is no. Why? Because they form a basis of a rem. And forming a basis to eigenvector must be orthogonal. And if they are orthogonal, the scalar product must be zero. And if the scalar product must be zero, Hmm? It means that others, a vector, should have at least some components with negative. Because the okay. scalar product of all the other vectors with this one should be zero. And this one has all components larger or equal than zero. So all the others should compensate. Because you know the scalar product is the sum of components times components. So the only vector which uh, satisfies the requirement that all centralities is larger or equal than zero is the one given by the Frobenius Perron theorem. So the eigenvector centrality is completely used, is that you take your matrix, you calculate the largest eigenvalue and the corresponding largest eigenvector, sorry, the corresponding eigenvector gives you a ranking of the nodes, which is now overcoming the problem that I told you such that you, know, you are now central either if you have a lot of connections 
or if you are connecting people with a lot of connections. Okay, to close up the first class, I want to discuss on the two important things related to navigability. And they are efficiency and vulnerability of a graph. I tell you this, centrality is, uh, to centrality is good, but you will see there are many other centralities and we will uh, discuss uh, later on. Now I want to define efficiency of a graph. And the idea of efficiency is I want to calculate how efficient is my graph in distributing the information. Remember that I have matrix distance matrix. D is Dij. Hmm? So this tells me how many steps I have to do from node i to node j in the shortest path. We already discussed. So I can say if I have node i and node j, this have a distance dij. Now I consider the inverse of the distance, 1 over dij. What does it mean 1 over dij? 1 over dij is, so to say, the efficiency in transmitting information from node i to node j. If node i and node j are very close, 1 is the closest possibility, eh? if I have an information here, the step after is there. Okay? So, efficiency is 1. If I have uh, distance 10, I have much more complicated. So, efficiency in that shortest part is 1 over 10. So, then what I can do is I can define the efficiency of a graph G like 1 over n, n minus 1 divided by 2. Sum i different j, 1 divided the edge. Okay? So the efficiency of an all to all connected graph is 1. Because all to all connected means all nodes are connected to everybody else. And in any node, I do one step to reach the entire network. If I don't have an all to all connected graph, I have a quantity which is smaller than 1, and the efficiency as defined here is larger than 0 and smaller than 1. Efficiency is 0 when the node, the network, is disconnected. Because it means that there is one part where the distance is infinity. Okay? So, <coughs> no, sorry, when all. So, zero is when all nodes, there's no link. So, whatever, independently on ij, I always have zero. Okay? For any pair of nodes. This tells me how efficient, how efficiently information or whatever process spread in the network. So imagine that, for example, I have a network, I can make a perturbation in a given point. How rapidly, efficiently this perturbation affects the other nodes in the network. By means of efficiency, I can now define vulnerability. That is, now I ask myself how vulnerable is the network. And vulnerability is defined as drop inefficiency. So I have 
the network G and this network corresponds to efficiency EG then I suppose to make some damage to this network for example I destroy one node or I destroy one link in the network so I make a damage D and I obtain a new graph G prime which is graph G minus that node or minus that ring. What happens to the efficiency? Remember, the efficiency is the sum of all possible 1 over dij. And these dij are the shortest path between node i and j. So, when I kill a node, there are shortest path which use this node and shortest path which do not use this node. The shortest path that do not use this node, no problem. But the ones that were using this node needs to be redirected because this node does not exist anymore. And since they were the shortest path, the new redirection is larger than previous one. So efficiency will drop. Efficiency will always be that smaller in the new graph. Correct? <coughs> so I have, I can calculate the new G prime, efficiency G prime, which will be whatever it is, and the five delta G. G E minus G prime G sorry E G delta E E G minus E G prime. This delta E is associated to a given damage D. Notice the damage can be whatever, it can be I can destroy one node, I can destroy two nodes, I can destroy uh, one link, I can, I can destroy a group of links, I can destroy... So, for whatever damage I do to an original structure, I can calculate the corresponding drop in, uh, in efficiency. And now I define classes of damage. For example, I define the damages uh, in which I destroy one, one node. I have n possible damages. Destroying node number one, destroy node number two, destroy node number three, okay? Or the class of destroying the link. I have L possible. Destroy link number one, destroy link number two. I define vulnerability in a class as the maximum drop of efficiency between elements of that class. So the vulnerability of a network is the maximum drop of efficiency related to a given damage. For example, suppose, let's suppose that the damage is destruction of a node. I have to destruct one, uh, destroy one by one the nodes of the network. For each node I have to calculate G prime. And for each possible damage, I have to calculate the drop in efficiency. The vulnerability of the network is the maximum, uh, is uh, the, the maximum value of this drop, and it, it, this will appear for a given node. So not only I can define the vulnerability of a network, but I can tell you where the network is vulnerable. Huh? And this is very important because the last thing I want to tell you uh, during this first lecture is what happens if I calculate vulnerability of heterogeneous and homogeneous graphs. So, typical, uh, the typical concept is that I want to assess <laughs> vulnerability because I want this graph to be robust. Hmm? 
Robust means that I want the day to be efficient, but I want also that if I have a random failure somewhere, that the graph maintains its properties. So what I can do, I can calculate vulnerability when I destroy one node. And now there is a big difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous graph. In homogeneous graph, the nodes are the same. So I can take this random failure randomly. Because whatever node I, I try, more or less, they give me the same drop of efficiency. When I calculate this heterogeneous graph, there is a big difference between random failure and targeted attack. Random failure is, I have a system of, uh, for example, power units which are producing energy. I have a random failure. Targeted attack is I have a terroristic group and I ask myself, I want to do the damage. I want to do the maximum damage I can to a structure where I have to put the bomb, where I, which is the node I have to kill. The node with the high centrality? Sorry? The node with the high centrality? Exactly, the node with the high centrality. So, the idea is that if you compare heterogeneous structure with homogeneous structure, in heterogeneous structure you have a vulnerability which is independent on the centrality of the nodes. So basically, whatever node you kill, you get more or less the same procedure, whereas in uh, heterogeneous network you have a curve like this. So, heterogeneous networks are much more robust than homogeneous networks on random failure or not with low centrality. So that's why people think that uh, biological network organized this because biological network they needed to be robust against random mutations. So when you take a random network, you you get. Uh, 99% nodes here. Hmm? But on the, on the same thing, the heterogeneous networks are much more vulnerable for targeted attacks. Because you have these apps. And because if you destroy the, the towers in New York, you know. The things that you cannot do with the homogeneous network. For, for the, making a damage, a, a, a complete damage to the system in homogeneous network, you need to put many bumps here, there, there, there. In, uh, in, uh, in heterogeneous network, you have this, they are very, very sensible to one, two, three nodes. And that's why hubs are protected with infrastructure protection policies and here and there. So the second part of my lecture of today is centered on mesoscales. So what we discussed up to now is uh, microscopic things of the network. How I am connected, degree, degree correlations, distances, and so on and so forth. Now I want to make a step ahead and tell you I have the microscopic scale, which is the node. Then I have the macroscopic scale, which is the entire network. And in the middle, I have several mesoscopic scales, middle scales. And these middle scales are very important in many, many processes, especially <coughs> in social networks. So in order to start, I want to uh, discuss with you of this example. This example is a very old example, 1977, but it introduced the concept of uh, community structure, or if you want, modules. 
So this fellow, Zachary, was an anthropologist. He was a young anthropologist, and his PhD study was monitoring 34 guys which were the members of a karate club. You know what is a karate? So these were members of the same club. And this person, this Zachary, passed one year following, spying them. If two people went to have dinner together, he said, ah, they are friends. I put a link. This apparently was a stupid project, just to you know, monitor a group of people and see who is friend of whom. But he was very, very lucky. He was extremely lucky and very intelligent. He was lucky because <coughs> immediately after realizing the network, this is the network he constructed. So for example, node 4 is friend with node 3, node 1, node 13. The, there was a, a, a big clash between node number one and node number 34. Big discussion. Node number one was the owner of the club. And node number 34 was a trainer. OK? So they discussed it. They clashed. And then node number 34, the trainer said, I leave the club. And I go and I found a new karate club. So he left the club went in another place and found another karate club. So there was this division. And as a, a result of this division, some of the original members of the club remained in the club, and some other left together with the trainer to the new club. <coughs> and Zachary asked himself, if I have the structure of the network, can I predict which one will remain with the owner and which one will leave with the trainer? Okay, you understand the question. If I have the original structure to the graph, now forget the colors, the white are the ones who remained, the gray are the ones who left, but forget the, the, the white and the, the gray, imagine that I have everything white, can you put, please, the color on, on each one of the nodes? So this is the first example of a modular network. What does it mean, modular network? A network, big, which contains two structures, two communities. OK? And this is very important, because community is not one node, are group of nodes, which uh, <coughs> then, in a given situation, act together in a cooperative way. So these are doing something, these others are doing something. So how I define this? So mathematically, if I have a graph, a community, or cluster, or cohesive subgroup, is a subgraph. It's a a group of nodes, G prime, whose nodes are tightly connected. And this structure have, are a subset of the network nodes. We, this is very important. Within which the network connections are dense, but between which they are sparse. What does it mean? It means that in, in, in real world networks, the density of connections is not homogeneous. We spoke about homogeneity in the degree, but also the density of connection is not homogeneous. For example, if you take this graph, you see that there are three structures, this, this, and this. And inside this structure, there are many connections. Inside this community, there are many connections. Inside this community, there are many connections. And then there is only one, two, three, four, five links connecting members of one community to members in the other community. So the big, big 
uh, group of links are within communities. They are connecting members of the same community. And only very little no links exist, little number of, of links exist in between the two communities. So we say that this structure are subset of nodes, one, two, three, within which, uh, within which connections are dense, there are many connections, but between which they are sparse. Okay? And uh, these communities are found everywhere. Are found in biological networks, in social networks, the famous club, in recommendation network, ecological networks. And the important point is the hierarchy of these communities reveals the hierarchical functioning of the networks. <coughs> now, so the original problem of Zachary is I give you the, all the network, can you partition this network and give me the structure of community and the composition of each one of the communities? Now, if you do like this, and here I hope not to be wrong, the identification process of such community is formally equivalent to the classical graph partitioning problem in computer science. So you are from computer science, you know much better than me what is this problem. This problem is known to be rigorously an NP-complete problem. So it's very, very hard to solve. And since the real world networks are very huge, very big, it con they contain a lot of nodes, the solution, the rigorous solution is almost impossible. For example, if I give you Facebook, or we were speaking before about opinion network. I have millions of people, and I want to study this community. It's practically impossible to do in a rigorous way. So people started to develop community detection algorithm in a sizable network way. It is. I want to, of course, find solutions which are not rigorous, eh, but yet they are approximate, but li leave me the possibility of managing with such graphs. And the first uh, problem, the first uh, uh, problem was uh, uh, solved by uh, Girvan and Newman, and I need to introduce for you another important concept of network, which is betweenness, a property of a node to stay in between two nodes. Remember the famous things I told you, I have this situation, no? One million node here, one million link here, but no links in, in between the two things. So <coughs> this node is very important because stay in between two important nodes, okay? How can I calculate the betweenness or load? So first I have to define a load of a link. And the idea is the following. I take all possible pairs of nodes. For example, I take this node and this node. And I calculate the shortest distance. Shortest distance is two. Okay? In order to make this distance, I need this link and this link. So I charge one to this and one to this. Because there is one shortest path that is making use of these two links. Then I take another pair of nodes. This and this. I calculate the shortest distance. And I charge one on each one of the links which form this shortest distance. 
So this is plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. And I continue. I do for all possible pairs of nodes. After I do for all possible pairs of nodes, each link ends up with a load, which is the number of shortest paths which are realized through that link. Correct? Now you understand that these two links are very charged, these two. Because if I take any node here and any node there, I need to pass here. No? So the load of this will be one million, because I have one million node here, one million node there, and all the possible combination needs to pass here. Sorry, and um, what to do if there are several shortest paths? One over n. It's written here. Oh. So the load Lij of the link connecting node i and j quantifies the traffic of shortest path that are making use of that link. Precisely. For each pair of nodes, I prime, J prime in the network, one counts the number N I prime, J prime of geodesics. Geodesics means shortest path. <coughs> Connecting node I prime and J prime. For each one of such a shortest path, one adds one over n to the load of each link, forming it. The load distribution retains full information on the network structure of pathways at the global level. OK? And these loads are important because, for example, think about this as an hydraulic pipeline. If you have a flow of liquid, you need uh, this uh, tube, this pipeline, to be very big, and this to be not big. Because if you do the same pipeline, this pipeline can collapse, can be destroyed, because there are more flow of shortest path over that link. So all problems of failure, congestion, jamming, and as we will see, synchronization, uh, make use of this quantity, OK? So the betweenness is the number of shortest paths that are using this link, OK? And now <clears throat> Newman and Girvan proposed the following algorithm. Suppose I have <coughs> a network like this. And I want to study the structure of communities, I mean the, the mesoscales. So the idea is I take the network and I calculate the betweenness score for each of the edges. This, 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 this. OK? I calculate the betweenness score. Then I remove the edge with the highest score. So I take a copy of my network, which is the same network minus one link. And this link is the link which has the highest betweenness. Then I ask myself, my new network is still connected If the network is still connected, I redo step one. I recalculate the betweenness, because now I removed one link with a lot of betweenness, so I have many shortest paths that has to be redistributed. And I remove the second edge with highest betweenness. If the network starts to be disconnected, I found the first disconnection, the first clustering, the first two clusters. And then I use on each one of the cluster, I continue the same. The main idea is that 
The two communities are this, one and two. And when I remove the links with highest betweenness, I remove one of these two links. Hmm? Because uh, the betweenness, the original betweenness, this serves only for this local distribution, where this is the... So, going back uh, to previous slides, uh, you see, the, this uh, link inside the, 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 the community have a very small load, whereas uh, the, link, the few links uh, which are in between the community, they have very high load. Because for realizing any shortest path from one node here to one node here, you have to pass necessarily through these links. And so the idea is that if I remove one, if I remove one by one this link, I can cut the network and find the separation of the network in the three communities. You understand the point, how it works, the algorithm? So the algorithm is, I first take a network, I calculate the betweenness, I remove the edge with the highest betweenness. And then I look if I am still connected or not. If I'm still connected, I recalculate betweenness, remove the edge. The moment in which I disconnected, I found the first cutting. Then on each one of these two pieces of the network, I repeat the same and I find the second cutting, the third cutting, the fourth cutting. So I get, by means of this algorithm, which is called the Girvan Newman algorithm, the so called dendrogram of my network. What is the dendrogram? I start with a unique component here, then I remove the link. And I have the first split in two, then the second split, the third split, up to all links are removed and all nodes are isolated without links. Okay? So, please. Sorry? After the first cut. The first cut, you have this nodes in a, in a component, all these nodes, second component, all these nodes, and now you take this as two separate network, and on each one of them you make this, the second cut. <coughs> now, in order to assess how good is modularity, they introduce this parameter, which is a little bit difficult to understand, so please understand it correctly. The idea is, Suppose that I have a network and I have a partition into NC communities. For example, here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight communities at this stage, okay? At this stage I have one, two, three, four, five communities. At this stage I have two communities, okay? So I have, I can define a matrix E which is n community times n community. So for each community, I have an entry in the matrix. And the elements E, I, J are the fraction of total links connecting a node in partition I with a node in partition J. OK? So if I have two connections, I have matrix 2 times 2, such that element number 1 is number of link from elements in partition 1 to elements in partition 2, understand, and vice versa. Now, the sum of any row or column of E, Bi equals some J, Eij, is the fraction of links connected to partition E, I, because I take the sum of over, over all the other partition of the number of links connected to partition I. Hmm? So this quantity gives me the total number, the total fraction of links which ends in a node belonging to partition I. Now, this quantity, if I would have uh, a generic random 
connection. If I have a network with no community, so I randomly put uh, links, the expected intra-community links would be bi square. So what I do is I compare the sum over a column of this eij minus bi square, and this is the modular parameter. That is, it tells me how different I am from a random placement of my links. Hmm? And here you see the modularity as a function of the dendrogram. So you see that initially, when the entire net, there is only one component, modularity is zero, obviously, because there is only the same component. The first partition in two corresponds to this modularity. Then there is another partition here, which corresponds to a better modularity, which is one, two, three, four, five. So the modularity tells you which is the best partition, because it's the partition which render your system more distinguishable from a noisy network. So with this, this modularity parameter, you take the maximum, and then you read the community. So one community is, is made by these, these nodes. Another community is made by these nodes. A third community is made by these nodes, four communities made by these nodes, and then there is unique node here. You see, no? This is the exactly, uh, this is the exact application of the Girvan Newman stuff to the Zachary Club. So they took the Zachary Club, and you see it's very good because all the white guys are here. All the gray guy are, he are there except node number three, which sometimes goes one way, sometimes goes the other way. So it's not the perfect partition, but it's correct. It gives a reasonably good result. How this method is going algorithmically? I need to calculate the distances, and this is an n-square problem, because I have to take all possible pairs of nodes hmm, to calculate the betweenness. It's an n-square problem. Then I have to repeat for all the nodes, because I re remove one link, so I have an n-square problem times, sorry, the number of links, n-square times L. This means that if my network is sparse, so L scales as n, this is n cubed. And if it is dense, this is n to the fourth power. OK? So this goes like n cubed for sparse networks and n4 for, for dense networks. OK? I define sparse networks, net, those networks where the number of links scales as the linear power of the number of nodes. And uh, as a dense network, those networks where the number of links scales quadratically with uh, the number of nodes. So it's much better than the complete NP problems, because this is polynomial. OK? But still, it's very large. It's very demanding, because I need, if I, I have one million nodes, if n is 10 to the 6, n to the 3rd is 10 to the 18, and n to the 4th is 10 to 24. It's big number of uh, calculation I have to make. So people started to, this, to say, OK, this is good. It gives me very nice description or level, blah, blah, blah. But can I do better? Typically, can I do n square? Because the n you cannot do. But n square, OK, so n square is good. And this is given by synchronization. So I anticipate something about synchronization that I will tell tomorrow. 
But uh, uh, the idea is the following. So first of all, let me show you what synchronization is. Synchronization is uh, a phenomenon hmm, in which uh, different elements of a network start to work uh, in the same way. And I show you, for example, a very nice example of a movie of synchronization. Oh, this one. So people, you see, started putting 64 metronomes. Sorry, eh? it's a little bit noisy. If you look at here, so So if you look at here, they start the metronome, you see, and they let them go, and you will see at the given point all the metronome are synchronous. Hmm? Become synchronous, you, you will see I advance a little bit. Now they are almost synchronous. These are in antiphase. <laughs> but if you wait a little bit, they go all synchronous, like uh, you know, an army. Tum, 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 tum. Okay. So this is a network uh, of a metronome. Each one, uh, the only thing that they are doing, they are staying on a plate which is suspended. So if they are asynchronous, they move, they 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 make some perturbation, and each one is uh, feeling the force of the other. OK? But you see, this is clear. And then they remain like this forever. Huh? I can show you something uh, also a little bit more uh, biologic than this. This is uh, a, a, an artificial system. These are fireflies. Ah, you see? There are fireflies staying on a tree, and they're flashing all together. Track, track. Because they want to attract females, and if they're flashing in the night one and one, they don't make a big, uh, uh, a big effect. If they're flashing all together, you can see them from far away. This is a tree in the Southeast Asia. So you go with a boat during the night, and you see this, uh, these things. You see these things here. Where is this? Okay. So you see some, some fireflies, you know, here they they do some, but they usually flash all together. So they synchronize the flashing period. They look at them and then synchronize the flashing period. So from a point of view of networks. So this is, how can I remove this? Well, well. So from a point of view of networks, the idea is what is happening if I study synchronization in a network? So imagine that uh, now take each node of the network, and I put on each of such nodes an oscillator like a metronome. And this oscillator is nothing but a given vector x, which is the state vector. For example, in the case of a metronome, is the value of the phase of the metronome. But in general, you can take any uh, oscillatory system, so two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, whatever you want. And the derivative in time of this is a function fxi, which uh, would be the function of this uh, state in the absence of the network, plus a network connection. And now all the trick is that 
I put the network connection, okay, weighted by a factor which is the load of the link IJ to some alpha value. So the idea is the following. Suppose that I succeed to create synchronization of all the network, like the fireflies. So it means that all these oscillators will synchronize together. Then I fix sigma, which is the scuffling strength, and I decrease alpha. What I do when I decrease alpha is that I put a coupling in each one of the link, which is inversely proportional, because alpha is now negative, to the load. So, since the load is big in between the communities and inside the community is low, I am increasing the link inside the community, increasing the interaction, and decreasing the interaction between the communities. So, if two nodes were connected inside the community, this connection not only is maintained, but is increased. Therefore, these two nodes, they were before synchronized, they will remain synchronized. But if I have now one link between this node and this node, this link will have a very high betweenness. When I decrease alpha, I make it smaller and smaller and smaller. The same concept and removing in the case of Girvan and Newman. So I expect a given point in which all this group of oscillators will remain synchronous. All this group of oscillators will remain synchronous, but they will remain synchronous on different frequencies. They will form a two cluster of frequencies. And so by reading the frequencies of each oscillator, I'm reading the belonging of this oscillator to which community in the network. So the idea is, I can prove this, uh, I cannot tell, so the idea is I start from here, you see, I have these equations, I have a complete coupling strength, and then I have a, 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 a power which is function of t. <coughs> I start at time t equal, at z uh, equal to zero with alpha equal to zero. So basically I don't wait because alpha equal to zero means uh, L for each lij, lij to the, uh, to the zero is equal to one. So I'm considering the unweighted networks, and in the unweighted networks, I fix sigma to sigma zero, being sigma zero the value of the coupling strength that warrant complete synchronization. So I choose the coupling for which all the network is synchronized to a unique frequency. Huh? And then what I do, I gradually decrease alpha stepwise in time and monitor the desynchronization scenario. And what you see, we can do with the opinion changing rate model. It's a model of opinion formation or coupled circle map. You can take whatever system you want there. But if you do with Kuramoto, uh, sorry, with Karate Club, you see, Initially, for alpha equal to zero, you have all, net, all the nodes have the same frequency. These are the frequency of the nodes. Then you decrease alpha, and you arrive to a point in which the network split. Some node assume this frequency, some node assume this other frequency. <laughs> and this is exactly the, part, the first partition in the uh, Kratek Lab system. You can monitor the modularity. So you have this group of node against this group of node. You can do for food web. This is a very nice modular system. It's a, a, a food web in a, in, a, in a fishing area. So there are two kinds of fishes. The one who likes to 
to, uh, um, to swim in the surface and the one who likes to swim in depth. So clearly they form into community because predators uh, uh, in the depth area only eat fish in the depth area and predators in the surface area they only eat fish which are in the surface area. Only very rarely and indeed you have a very nice but dynamical partition eh, in which, so this is important for two things. First of all, it's important because you see that this is an n square because you basically have to calculate the, uh, you, you have to calculate the, the betweenness only once at the beginning and then you, you, you automatically decrease them. You don't have to recalculate all the times. So it is n squared plus n because you have n differential equations. So it's much better, but in most, more importantly, it tells you the relevance of uh, mesoscales because you see that the partition that you have is reflected in the, in the real dynamics. So when you put the dynamics on top of a network, you know, the functioning of the network is modular. So this network at a given value functions like two modules, one at a given frequency, another at another given frequency. And the members who work at the given frequency are exactly the members of partition one, and the other one are exactly the member of partition two. So what you have seen here, just like purely as a, a, a purely as a, a, if you want, a, a structural problem, it has a dynamical consequence. And the dynamical consequence is that the organization of the dynamics is clustered. Okay? So, Again, this is n square. You can compare this uh, uh, mechanism, the, 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 the comparative test for the quality of your predictions, and are very good. The advantages, of course, is uh, each calculation of loads take order n square operations. The evolution of the system equation takes order, order n operation at each time step. So the improvement is uh, more and more significant as n increases. So with this, you can treat problem with large scale network, what you cannot treat with the Girvan and Newman. And, uh, and that's all for the day of today.